everybody. This is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And welcome to the Invested Podcast, where we're coming to you from Zurich, Switzerland, and south of Atlanta, Georgia. Indeed. A farm out there, which shows you the value of getting infrastructure, code words for internet, deep into the rural parts of the world, <laughs> deep into Zurich. Hidden, I didn't know where that little, was going. A little enclave <laughs> hidden in the mountains in Europe. That's that right. No one can find. Filled with underground bunkers, filled with Nazi gold, and oh, really? All sorts of ill begotten gains ah. uh, covered up with cows and happy, beautiful. Forests. You better find that stuff and give it back to its rightful owners. That's right. That's right. Nasty. <laughs> it's the constant joke in Europe that Switzerland is like the evil money hoarders. And I shouldn't even oh, say this stuff publicly because it's just like a little, it's a little Swiss joke. Yeah, there goes your Swiss citizenship. Yeah, exactly. Goodbye. Yeah. We don't need your type around here. That's right. Well, we are um, <laughs> obviously talking they're doing, about Let me investing. just say they're doing a very good job around Switzerland of complying with the various money laundering requirements worldwide. Excellent job. I know many people in the banking industry and it is their full-time job to comply with these things. Doesn't it seem unfair, there. though, if you're going to go to all the risk of being a drug dealer murdering kidnapping kind of person that you can't hide your money anywhere that doesn't seem fair it's so much trouble (laughs) (laughs) i have heard stories from friends who uh who are in the bank banking industry about how it like the stories are true you know people used to like show up with duffel bags filled with money and they would put them in their numbered accounts and you can't do that anymore you just you know those days are gone I, I think in general, the the governments have a surveillance process that is becoming more and more sophisticated all the time. And it includes our cell phones, obviously. They, they know where we are. They listen to us. Not they. There's not a they. It's just like machines listen to us. And we know because if we talk about, I don't know, buying a garden hose, the next thing you know, here come ads for garden hoses. So it's, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Wait, have you actually experienced that with just talking? Oh yeah, I have not noticed time. that. I've heard oh, people yeah, say it, but I've never, I've never. Oh, it happens all the time. Absolutely. To you personally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you didn't write it own. in an email. Oh uh, no, You're nothing. Just picking it up on the phone. <laughs> it's amazing, man. <laughs> the whole 1984 concept of having to have a, uh, a listening device and television, two-way television in your home is like. Pfft. We got cell phones and everybody's got one and they can't live without them. And probably, I mean, the next step would be if they're surveilling somebody <clears throat> who has a cell phone and all of a sudden the cell phone goes off, then they know for sure this they're trying to avoid. Yeah, they're in. Ne- oh, you mean if, if they turn off the power? Yeah. Oh, oh. No, I think you can even phone. track now when the power is off. Oh, yeah. You can track when the power's off. You got to yeah. get rid of it completely. Yeah. Like, Put it someplace. It's really quite amazing. The Taliban uh, pioneered ways of of fighting against uh, our armies by turning off their cell phones and sending runners. I mean, really, just back to medieval messaging. Next thing you know, it's going to be pigeons. We, I, you know, when we were down in the Grand Canyon, um, a friend of mine uh, decided to experiment with with homing pigeons. Wait, are you talking like recently or like in the 70s? Yeah, in the 70s. Okay. Because then we didn't have, you know, the the sophisticated satellite communication. And so if you're on a long river trip down the Grand Canyon, you can't, it's very difficult in lots of places in the Grand Canyon to even hike out at all. You can't get out of there. Yeah, that's the terrifying thing. So if you have somebody get injured and you need to get a message out to somebody to get a helicopter or whatever... There was no way to do it. The only only way we could do it was signaling an air, aircraft, and that is very unlikely to be effective. So um, back then, Wesley figured, well, we'll raise homing pigeons in Williams, Arizona, which is which would be where they'll fly back to, and then we'll take them down the Grand Canyon. So he did it, and uh, I'm missing the connection. Well, if you. If you have a problem in the Grand Canyon and you have to f- get a message out, you fly a homing pigeon out. 
So you like wrap a message around the leg mm -hmm. yeah. and fly. It. Okay, got it. Totally, you know, sixteen eighty three. You know, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so Wesley brought a, a a few pigeons with him on our test trip, and um, well down at the bottom of the canyon, which is happens about five days into the trip, you get down where you're five thousand feet down, and um, he released. One of the pigeons put a message on it. Released one of the pigeons at the you know that somebody is going to be looking at the cage in Williams, and we watched that pigeon just circling up, 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 and then there was a poof of feathers. No. Yes, some predator, <gasps> some occipiter up there, probably a oh, falcon. Yeah. Just nailed it. It was just like, oh, oh, oh that didn't work. That oh. was we didn't even think about those guys. <laughs> so we, Wesley didn't want to have his pigeons die because he liked them. And <clears throat> so we took him on down farther down the river. We got about 10 days down the trip. We were camping at this big open sandbar, um, really a beautiful place. And, and in the middle of the night, at about 2 a.m. comes these pigeon screams. And oh gosh, is this a whole story about the death of pigeons? <laughs> Koala Monday, which is a kind of a cat slash raccoon. It's got posable thumbs that can open things. Oh my gosh. Slunk himself in there onto the boat with the pigeons and got into the cage and killed no. them all. Oh. oh yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. Not horrible for the, for the cat. <laughs> It was horrible for the pigeons, no doubt. Yeah, this thought was clear. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that there's two sides to this story. One of them is Yeah, you cat. brought a beautiful <clears throat> captive feast. For, exactly. It was for an animal. Wesley, Wesley had a very bad he was very distraught by all this, I think. I bet. Yeah, it was sad. So, any case, That's we're uh, That's... back to that, I guess. <laughs> we're headed to those directions. You want to have secret communications. That's that's where we're headed. So anyway, I don't know how we got on that, but well, I don't know, but I'm fascinated. I think we're talking a little send... bit about the potential for a major economic train wreck in the United States. Anyway. Wait, is there such a thing as like a predator homing bird that could beat off other predators? Like, um, well, I think some roosters do pretty good. No, no, but they have to fly home is the oh, key. Man. Oh, like like something like um a, like, like falcons you have a or falcon something that can fly. Yes, <clears throat> I'm not very up on. In Harry right? Potter, they have owls. Ah, can we have owls? Well, I'm, I'm never. I'm sure there are people that have sort of learned how to work with an owl. If they raise <laughs> them or something. Um, but we do like my brother-in-law is an expert falconer. He's one of the best in in the whole area. People come to him all the time for advice and. He hunts these beautiful hawks all the time. It's really amazing to watch him. I can understand why it's a real art. Mm -hmm. But I, they come to his fist because he feeds them. Otherwise, they don't eat. And that that's, mm -hmm. looks to me like to be the trick. It's like you want to eat. The only way you can eat is you come to my fist and then I feed you. Oh, and they, that's kind of rushed. So they're captive. Yeah. Well, oh. they're sort of captive. I mean, they can fly away whenever they feel like it, obviously. Um, if they figure it out and eventually I guess they do and they, they, they go or you sort of release them by not, I, I really don't know how they do it. I shouldn't, shouldn't speculate, <laughs> <laughs> but they, okay. they come back to him. So we've so not maybe, solved the technology requirement here. No, basically. I, don't, I don't think they figured that part out yet. Um, uh, I mean, this is sort of on, on my mind slightly just be <laughs> and a little bit facetiously because I don't think we're going to have a civilization meltdown, but I think we are looking toward a pretty significant change in the way the economy is functioning and the markets are working. And I thought maybe we could talk about that today a little bit. Yeah, well, we kind of talked about it like a couple episodes ago um, about like where we saw the market going in the future. And as usual, we came to no conclusions. But you ended saying something like... What would happen if the mar if the um, interest rates went up to six percent? So, one thing that you know people are wondering, and there's a lot of chatter out there, is about what happens if the Fed raises interest rates and 
how much could they possibly raise interest rates? So one thing people are saying is that they probably would raise them only a small amount, 1%, 2%, because if they raise more than that, the interest rate gets so high to the point where it's hard to service the federal debt. It makes things a lot harder on lenders, et cetera. It's just a big crash to the market, to the overall, not the stock market necessarily, but the overall economy dealing with that would be difficult. So that's what I'm seeing. What are you thinking? Well, I think that's right. They <clears throat> they don't want to crash the economy. And basically, the Federal Reserve is a central bank in, in the United States, and its job um, is to maximize employment. <clears throat> and And so... It, it does what it does to try to keep people employed. And, and that was the reason it was created back in, I think, 1913 or something, is because we used to have very sharp, sudden uh, recessions that you know, suddenly you'd have all these people who were unemployed and it was really a very difficult time. And then it would recover relatively quickly. Now we have much, much softer kinds of recessions and they tend to take a lot longer to recover. But it seems to be better, um, except for one little problem, and that is that um, ever since they really put this scheme into effect in the U.S., they have been devaluing the currency um, at a very steady to sometimes precipitous rate. And and that devaluation is felt by people and, and a, as a form of inflation. So inflation mm-hmm. is just prices are rising. Mm-hmm. And that can happen for um, reasons like so there's just no supply and there's still a lot of demand. In other words, people have money, but there's nothing to buy, which is a little bit like what's kind of going on right now because of the mm-hmm. the, the the supply bottlenecks as a result of uh, a lot of people quitting working and, and um, sort of the labor bottlenecks being created and that creates a supply bottleneck. And But it turns out that their demand is very strong in the U.S. There's a lot of money out there. And that is the other side of the inflation equation. If you print money and you don't make other make the money supply disappear from somewhere else, um, which is kind of what happened in 2008, a lot of a lot of quote money right assets disappeared in 2008 because of the meltdown of the bond market, and so people had money in houses and house bonds, and they just disappeared. There was no money. Mm, yeah. So they they printed a lot of money back then, and it didn't really create any inflation because they were filling a hole. But this time around, there was no hole um, in 2020, and President Trump poured trillions of dollars into the market. So there's a really interesting slide you, or you could take a look at if you want to uh, at the Federal Reserve. In fact, this is a super good place for... This kind of um, data is the Federal Reserve in St. Louis in the U.S. is called the FRED, F-R-E-D. So if you Google FRED and then whatever you're looking for, um, in this case M1, you just put FRED M1 in Google and up will come a chart produced by the Federal Reserve about the money supply. And what it shows right now is so stunning. You you should probably have to take a look at it to believe it. But in... uh, in um, 2020, we had four trillion dollars of M1 money supply. M1 money supply is just the money in your checking account, and the money in your wallet, and all that, and savings accounts, and all that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had four trillion in there, and 24 months later, we have 20 trillion in there. I think I've seen this chart. Yeah, it's like this massive rise. Uh, of generally just money being available, mm-hmm. household type of money. Mm-hmm. It's unprecedented. People are sitting here waiting with their money. Yeah. Well, they're trying to buy stuff. And as a result, prices are going up like crazy. So for example, um, well, going from $4 trillion to $20 trillion means that they have printed 80% of all the U.S. dollars ever printed in history got printed in the last two years. And that, and that money isn't being earned. It's just been printed. And as a result, you have all this money that, that wasn't there, and now it's there, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. <clears throat> and so people, some of them just got paychecks from the government and have, have been earning money kind of in their little side scams going on out there, you know, your little side, side gigs, what? whatever you call it. 
Oh, well, people, okay. people, where you, you collecting cash? You said side cash scams. And you, side, what do you call that? A side, side hustle. Deal. Side <laughs> hustle. There it is. And and so people are still earning money, but they're not reporting it to the federal government. They're not paying taxes on it, so that gives them more money to spend. And then they've got these payments from the government, even more money to spend. So all this money now is chasing a limited supply because we got a squeeze on supply. People aren't working as much. And you have more money in the mar- in the marketplaces than ever on an order of like five to four to one, something like that. Yeah, but I so think it's also just it. just saving, aka not spending. Oh, the spending is happening. The spending the is happening, is but hot. not as much. Yeah, more. What does more Actually, mean? More means more than 2019. Demand the demand side is higher in terms of spending, buying goods, all that. It's higher than it was before the pandemic started. Now. And what that means is that you have X supply and you have 2X, I'm just exaggerating, but you have 2X trying to buy that supply. Prices are going to go up. People aren't stupid. If you got a lot of people that want to buy your house, you're going to raise your price. You have a lot of people that buy your products, you're going to raise your price. And then if you have a lot of people that want to buy the plastic that products are made out of, kind of a business to business thing, you're going to raise your price. And that's what Berkshire came out uh, last year, and Buffett just said, hey, we're, abs- you know, they've got so many different businesses, 80 or 90 companies. They said, we are absolutely experiencing a price rise that's sticking. In other words, mm-hmm. we, uh, we are paying it, and we are also raising our prices, and the people we're selling to are paying it, and this is real inflation. That means the, the buying power of the dollar is deteriorating rapidly, at a rate they just published of 7% uh, per year. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, I'm missing something here. So okay, what are you missing? The amount that people have in their checking accounts, money market accounts, et cetera, mm-hmm. has massively increased. Mm-hmm. But you're saying... That's not because they're not spending as much. You're saying that's because they have earned more money. So you're saying they're spending the same. Spending, they're actually spending more now. But they have way, 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 it's not even like a little bit more. It's like four times as much more money in their accounts. Well, that's not exactly right. It's the 20 trillion, the 4 trillion that we had was money in circulation, let's just call it. It's moving around. Doesn't mean it's sitting in somebody's account for Ah, 20 20 months. It's just in their account, then it moves to another account because they spend it. And now that went up to 20. And so it's that's 20 trillion that's circulating around the economy now. Oh, so this is something totally different than what I, what I've seen is like this, what's in money market accounts has massively increased. Right. But that's That's true literally what's in accounts, not just sort of generally circulating around. Well, that's part of what's in in M1 is money market accounts and so on. Okay. Yeah. People are saving more. They're, they've got more in their money market accounts. They're spending more, they're feeling richer and they're driving prices up. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, so prices are going up. I agree, but I also think people are not, I mean, you're saying people are spending more, so I just have to believe you. But um, it, that doesn't square for me with also people having more money in their accounts. It doesn't. I mean, you know, let's say you get $10, you save five and spend five. Yeah, but the only way that works is if suddenly like overall lots of people are making way more money. Well, they're not necessarily making it. They have it. It's coming <laughs> from something. Yeah, it's right? coming from something. Yes, and that something, it came from their government check. It came from there. You go. Not spending it. It came right. from whatever. I mean, this is why the luxury industry went insane over the pandemic because all of a sudden we were all not spending on all the things we typically spend on, like restaurants and travel. And it's like, right. oh look, I have an extra two thousand dollars. I can go buy that Louis Vuitton bag, and people That's right. did. So we watched this and, and the Federal Reserve came out um, you know, last year and basically said, oh, don't worry, it's just temporary, all this inflation, this increase in prices. But 
that was that kind of surprised me. I mean, these are very sophisticated academics that, you know, that make these uh, pronouncements. But it surprised me because I was seeing wages go up aggressively everywhere. I remember talking, I think, about Bucky's. You <laughs> remember that gas station with like 120 pumps? And no. they've got a sign outside Bucky's saying, hey, you come and work in our car wash and we'll pay you $18 an hour. That was a year ago. Now I think they've raised it to 20. Mm-hmm. So this is just a basic beginner job at $20 an hour. And so that the, I mean, the thing with wages good. going up is I mean, prices might come down. I know, but here's the thing. With wages going up, um, they don't come down. I mean, you can't suddenly go to the guy working in the car wash and say, oh, well, we started you at 20, but now we're going to pay you 18. That mm-hmm. doesn't work. Mm-hmm. People will get crazy on you if you do stuff like that. So if wages aren't coming down, it's a little hard to see that that this is a temporary phenomenon. Um, plus, we've got another problem, a huge, gigantic problem in the way the Federal Reserve uh, calculates inflation today. They've changed it oh, dramatically. Well, yeah. yeah, that's true. Right? And so think about it. If they're calculating inflation differently than people are experiencing it, then a couple of things happen. Number one, their their response to that inflation rate may not be as robust as it needs to be to knock it out. And number two, people experience it as a bigger phenomenon and start to believe that it's really permanent and start to act as if it is. And when it gets into your head that inflation is a permanent thing, then you behave differently as a consumer. And you behave differently as a worker you're, in terms of your, your salary. You want more money and you want it on a regular basis to be more money because your cost of living is going up and you spend your money quicker. You don't save it someplace where they're paying you uh, 1% if the inflation rate is 7% mm-hmm. because you're just losing money like crazy on that deal, right? So, I learned that right here. All right, so look at we got it. We we got to continue on this, and I think it's a super good subject. So let's let's dive into this deeper uh, when we come back. You good with that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, more next time. Until then, time to go play. See you. Thanks, guys. everybody. Bye. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding. They really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And I'm really important. It's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that you're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only. And I really hope you enjoyed it.